In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As our society becomes more and more technically advanced, how are we coping with the changes we encounter within our everyday lives? iPhones and iPads, Bluetooths, or is that blue teeth? Smart thermostats, smart refrigerators, and more household items that we can control that make up smart homes. I have a friend whose parents have 47 data points in their house. Everything is controlled. You can now change the temperature, turn your oven on and off, bake bread, Start the washing machine. Control your irrigation system in your house from your iPhone while you are a continent away. A smart home allows you to control virtually everything in your house from your phone or tablet. You can watch who is outside your front door or any other part of your home for that matter. Again, all from your phone. I remember an episode of the Canadian sci-fi show Continuum, where hackers turned a wealthy family's automated protection in their smartphone on the family themselves. Some of you heard my sermon at the Great Vigil of Easter at the cathedral, where I forewarned of what artificial intelligence might do to ministry. I was right about it happening, but wrong about the timing, as it is not something that will happen in the future, it's already here. I just saw on TV, so it must be true, that a couple were married last week by artificial intelligence. <laughs> I'm certainly not a technophobe. I use some of these technologies myself, and in doing so, I've come to the realization that I'm kind of a gadget junkie. And while I embrace a lot of these cool gadgets, I think there should be some guardrails. When things become more controversial than they're worth, I'm equally happy to revert to doing things in the old-fashioned way. Dare I say, the analog way. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Who said that? It was a French critic, journalist and novelist, Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr, in January of 1849. See how smart I am? <laughs> Not really. Truth is, I had no idea, so I Googled it, and I got the answer. Again, it was on the internet. It must be true. Perhaps my love of science, and especially science fiction, goes back to watching Doctor Who in 1963 when I was six and living in Reading, England. I'm sad that Amelia's not here. I told her I would work Doctor Who into a sermon, and she didn't think I could do it. <laughs> Ray Bradbury once said, anything you dream is fiction, and anything you accomplish is science. The whole history of mankind is nothing but science fiction. That said, when I was in seminary, one of the rites of passage is that everyone buys the Anchor Bible Dictionary. I barely used it in 24 years, but I love that I have it. All that knowledge and factual info within the covers of those six volumes. If it's in the Bible, it's in the Anchor Bible Dictionary. You see, despite my appreciation for techie stuff, I bought the books. The Anchor Bible Dictionary could have been purchased as a collection of data disks. I 
paid $450 for the six volumes that can now be purchased, used on Amazon for 20 bucks a piece. Over two decades later, and now it is a digital download. But when it comes to encyclopedic information, I don't know about you, but I'd rather have it in book format. Books are analog, timeless, tactile. In keeping with the science fiction theme, Carl Sagan once said of books, what an astonishing thing a book is. It is a flat object made from a tree with flexible parts on which are imprinted lots of funny dark squiggles. But one glance at it, and you're inside the mind of another person. Maybe somebody who's been dead for thousands of years. Across the millennia, an author is speaking clearly and silently inside your head, directly to you. Writing is perhaps the greatest of all human inventions. Binding people together who have never known each other. Citizens of distant epochs. Books break the shackles of time. The Bible has been around for millennia and will no doubt be considered as one of the greatest works ever put into print even thousands of years from now into the future. I still prefer to read scripture in its analog format, that is, from a book, and not from a computer or personal device screen. In today's Gospel from Matthew, Jesus is looking at the people who surround him. Jesus is condemning the attitudes of that generation. Why? Because no matter what he said or did, the people took the opposite view. They rebelled against his message because he was challenging them to step out of their comfort zones. Jesus was encouraging them to move out into what we can call the mission field, instead of sitting back in their comfortable lives. For us today, this message has not changed. Some would argue it's even more important now than at any other time in our history. But I suspect that those who were alive in the 10th century or the 1600s felt pretty much the same way. Over the past few weeks, Matthew has been using Jesus' own words to prompt us into working for the greater mission of the church. Jesus tells us that we must leave behind the paralysis of indulgence, comfort, and apathy, and actually work to spread the good news. While the wording may appear complex, the structure of today's gospel is actually quite simple. Jesus reflects on the resistance of the people to John and himself. He then prays to God while inviting those with heavy burdens and who are looking for a new way to live and worship God to come to Him. Today's reading is actually two parts of the Gospel combined into one lesson. Verses 16 through 19, Jesus talks about the people's attitude, how they took opposite views of everything He said and did. In the second part, verses 25 through 30, Jesus tells us that he will ease our burden. He knows that the people were not paying close enough attention to his message and not living out the idea of spreading the good news. He goes on to give these reassuring words. Come to me, all that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. What are those burdens he's talking about? Throughout the 27 books of the New Testament, we repeatedly hear that they are. First, the self-inflicted challenges of our lives. 
die caused by our own sin. Then, the excessive demands of the religious leaders upon the people. Persecution. Christians were constantly being tortured and killed for their faith. And lastly, people sometimes suffer from a kind of weariness that is the result of always searching for God. To help the people understand this better, Jesus offers one of his typical agrarian analogies which exemplified that time period. In this case, a yoke. It typically joins two oxen together so that they can work together as a team. When Jesus invites us to take on his yoke and to learn from him, he is inviting us to join him in the harness, to allow him to take the lead and to let him help us through the difficult times. The Bible as we know it was made canon in its current and permanent format in the year 367 AD. With the 27 books of the New Testament officially adopted at the Church Council of Carthage in AD 397. That comes from the Anchor Bible that you read. This amazing book, the Bible, has continued to inspire us for the last 80 or so generations. Despite all the advancements we've made in a world where technology is moving at an exponential pace, the Bible remains one of the greatest works and best ways to structure a wholesome life of loving and caring for others. In today's gospel, Jesus is telling us that within our own being, we will find the strength we need to conquer our demons. Jesus is saying that if we accept the tenderness of his love, we will discover the spiritual strength that we require is actually already in us. This inner strength is something we all possess, and it is the strength and courage that you have always had, but perhaps you didn't realize. Jesus offers us, as his followers, an invitation to come and find rest and refreshment in him, while reminding us that every burden, every struggle, every type of restlessness, and whatever challenges that we may encounter in our lives, all those troubles will be lightened. To make this easier, he will ease our burdens and he will always be there for us. All we have to do is trust in him. Trust Jesus. Trust scripture. Read it in whatever format you prefer. As for me, I'm going to stick with my life application Bible in its book format. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.